grew up idolizing Tupac. I had a shrine to him. The first heck of a shot. Uh, <laughs> uh, talk to my parents more about the problems with that. I'm glad that's being taped. Um, so, uh, thanks for being here. Welcome, everybody. It's, great. it's a great showing we've got today. Uh, excellent to see you. Um, I'm Christopher Nichols. I'm a historian here at OSU. Uh, I'm directing our program on citizenship and crisis. And a big part of that is asking demanding sorts of questions of our audiences and of ourselves about uh, questions about the rights, limitations, responsibilities, and other ways of understanding citizens and citizenship. Uh, including uh, critical ways of uh, understanding the context of the world around us. Right? So we can't understand the present, say, carceral state without having a longer understanding of uh, the laws, uh, legal changes, the war on drugs, changes in racism, structural inequality, other kinds of structural racism, and all sorts of other facets um, that inform our contemporary moment. So first off, why this topic? Why all this interest? Uh, from my perspective as a historian in the U.S. and of international relations, the current crisis in, in incarceration has deep historical roots, and some of which you all will be dealing with today, and some of which we can talk about uh, in our Q&A. Um, most proximate uh, acceleration to the incarceral state lies with the last generation and a half shift in sentencing laws and the drug war and racism and changing dynamics of state and federal systems uh, of incarceration and privatization practices and treatment patterns and questions of rehabilitation and education and a host of other things related to that. A few statistics really reveal um, how much of an outlier the U.S. is in an international setting. And I think it's a great starting place to begin our conversation. Today, according to the United Nations, the U.S. contains roughly 5% of the world's population. But guess how much of the world's imprisoned population resides in the U.S.? A quarter, 25% of the world's prisoners reside in the United States today in 2015. That is a starkly illuminating fact. And I don't know how you can avoid it in any conversation about the U.S. The U.S. incarcerates approximately 716 people for every 100,000 residents. Some other most recent studies say closer to 700, so this is the 1 in 100 phenomenon. The closest other country per capita of major industrial uh, countries is 500 per 100,000, and that's Russia. Um, if you want to look down the list of comparable nations, they are something like, in aggregate numbers, the U.S., China, Russia, Brazil, India, Thailand, Mexico, Iran, and North Korea. Those are the U.S.'s international companions in its carceral state. In no other walk of life would that seem appropriate to any American, right? Uh, and yet we have surprisingly little attention paid to this international comparison with, which illuminates the injustices in the American state. Uh, the total incarcerated population in the U.S. is a whopping 2.4 million people, and this accounts for a roughly 500% increase in the last 30 years. That's astonishing. Imagine a 500% increase in any other walk of life in the U.S. And that would be something we would probably want to remark on every single day. With roughly one in every hundred adults in prison or in jail, and one in 30 adults behind bars on probation or on parole, the US, the U.S. is an absolute outlier in the international system. There's no other way to describe it than that. We could have a reasonable discussion about why that is, but that it's an outlier is a simple fact. So in terms of one partial causal theory for this, I thought I'd offer one that we could talk about. I'm sure you all have uh, on the panel more sophisticated ways of understanding it than I do. But uh, there are more people behind bars today at the, at the, in the U.S. at the local, state, and federal level for drug offenses than there were as the total prison population in 1980. So the war on drugs has to be seen as a causal part of this. Right? Now, to what extent? I'm not sure. So you guys who are experts on studying this can tell me more. How did we get here? Why are there so many prisons? Why are there so many prisoners? And what are the current trends and what can be done about this, assuming we agree that it's a problem? That's what we'll be dealing with today. So our panel is designed to inform and reflect, to provoke thought, uh, and to generate a meaningful discussion here amongst all of us in the room about what's going on with the state of uh, the US and imprisonment. So let me just introduce our panelists and let them run with this uh, fascinating, important, um, and crucial topic. First, we've got Brett Burkhart, who's an assistant professor of sociology in the School of Public Policy at Oregon State. Uh, professor Burkhart is currently conducting research on the use of private prisons in the U.S., and he's previously written on topics including felon voting rights, post-prison employment opportunities, and policing of mental illness, among other topics. At OSU, he teaches courses on law and society, crime policy, criminology, and research methods. And he holds an MA and a PhD in sociology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, well, again, thanks for the introduction, and I'm happy to be on this panel. <coughs> what I want to 
to talk about today is the role of private companies and public unions in punishment in the U.S. Um, Chris gave us some good numbers. I've got some pictures of those numbers. Uh, this is a graph of imprisonment rates in the United States over a long period of time, running from 1925 up to around 1980. And you can see uh, what we had was a very long history of an imprisonment rate right around 100 people in prison for every 100,000 in the population. There are some ups and downs there, of course, but this is a, a pretty stable trend over a long period. What happens next, you can probably guess, there's an increase, but you might be surprised at the scale of that increase. So now uh, we are up as Chris said, we're around 500 people in prison for every 100,000 people, but that number's closer to about 700 if we also consider people in jail as well. So this is a tremendous increase. It's historically unprecedented, and it's without equal in the modern industrial world. So, uh, to get to the title of the panel, why so many prisons? Why is this? Well, I'm going to hit this briefly. Uh, I think we can boil down the reasons for this rise in imprisonment to a couple of factors. The first and biggest is greater use of prison as a sanction. This seems obvious, right? Why so many prisons? Well, it's because we use prisons more. Uh, but there are a couple of more subtle points going on here. And one is that prosecutors increasingly prosecute crimes as felonies as opposed to misdemeanors. So this has the consequence of sending people to prison rather than giving them some other sanction like a fine or a term of probation or maybe nothing at all. Uh, we also have, though, prison being used as a sanction for people who violate conditions of their parole. So these can be technical, very minor violations, things like missing a meeting with a parole officer, failing a drug test. In a lot of cases, this can result in a person going back into prison and serving out the rest of their term. That's new. If we look at violent crimes, we also do see longer sentences being imposed. Uh, if we look at drugs, we see more arrests, so uh, more intensive of drugs. One thing you don't see up here, though, is crime. So it's not the case that that rise in imprisonment is due to increasing crime, because in fact, the crime rate has been decreasing throughout most of that rise in imprisonment. So we've brought about this spike in imprisonment uh, through sentencing practices and law enforcement practices rather than actual all right, so those are some of the causes, very briefly. Uh, I want to turn now to uh, a couple of consequences, one of which is the development of a private prison industry in the United States. So uh, private prisons, how do they work? Well, private prisons involve a contract between a private firm and some government entity, whether it be a city, county, state, federal government. But the government calls, uh, uh, calls for bids from the private sector, and then private firms compete to win the contract. Uh, the government then pays the winning firm, usually on a per inmate, per day basis. And in exchange, that firm takes over all of the duties that are related to incarceration. Uh, these private firms can operate on a not-for-profit basis, but more typically they operate for-profit. So some of the big ones are here. We've got the Geo Group Management and Training Corporation, or MTC, and Corrections Corporation of America, or CCA, which is the least. All right, so uh, these are publicly traded companies, so you or I could invest in them. If we'd done so, in the 2000s, we would have made a healthy profit. 
Um, what we have here is just a snapshot of about 10 years of stock prices for uh, CCA here, Geo Group here. You can see uh, those compared to the Dow Jones Industrial Average benchmark. Lowly Dow Jones returns here. Uh, the prison firms uh, provide a pretty healthy return. So, um, you would have been wise to invest in these companies. Uh, but despite the fact that they might be profitable, they also come with some criticism and some concerns. So, I want to mention those here. Uh, there are a variety of moral concerns with this. And one has to do with the fact that incarceration uh, is really a core government responsibility. It is a function that necessarily involves the restriction of people's freedoms. It's necessarily coercive. So as such, it's really different from more mundane contracting practices like contracting out for garbage collection or parks maintenance. Incarceration is Uh, but there are also concerns that the profit motive will introduce some perverse incentives into the system. So this might happen, uh, on the one hand, by private companies encouraging incarceration. So you can imagine that they can do this in two ways. One is to lobby government officials for tougher sentences that will increase the imprisonment rate. Uh, and then also, you can imagine that within facilities themselves, uh, workers, prison guards, may actually impose stricter discipline on the inmates. And that would have a consequence of forcing those inmates to stay in longer. Right? Popping up demand for prison guards. Uh, we also have some concerns that uh, the profit motive will uh, lead companies to cut corners. Hard to imagine, but you might uh, you might have reason to believe that private companies trying to turn a profit would reduce staffing or provide fewer benefits or less compensation to the workers or uh, provide fewer trainings. That then can potentially lead into more technical concerns related to cost and quality of the service that they're providing. Uh, now, as for cost. There is some evidence that private prisons can operate more cheaply than private than public prisons. That point is still debated, though. But to the extent that they do operate more cheaply, it's because they cut down on labor costs. Right? And it, you can only cut down labor costs so far before you start to sacrifice quality. So that gets to the last point here. Uh, there's no good evidence that private prisons perform better than public ones. That's the and in fact, there's some evidence that they perform worse. So on metrics like escapes, prisoner escapes, uh, staff turnover is higher by the prisons, uh, even his conduct is higher. Uh, so all, all of these things add up to a great deal of criticism that's been directed at the industry. But despite the criticism, the industry has thrived. Um, here we have the spread of uh, private incarceration over a number of years. We've got states shaded according to the number of inmates that are held privately. And you can see that from the early days of the 90s, where very few states had any inmates privately held, by 2005, almost all states did. Yeah. Here's a slightly different way of looking at it. Uh, just in terms of the sheer number of prisoners held in private facilities, we can see growth. Data on early private imprisonment is actually pretty bad, so we're relying on two data sources here. But they both point to the same phenomenon, which is that we've seen substantial growth in private incarceration since the 1990s, to a point where we now have about 100,000 people locked up by the private sector. Um, so that is real growth, but it's important to put this in perspective, right? After all, we have a lot of people in prison. So if we compare this the, to the total prisoner population, you can see that, in fact, the private 
uh, in this, uh, the private sector has taken over only a small fraction of the total prison population. So it's still uh, a minor player, despite its, its growth. Uh, but the future doesn't look so bright for the private sector. So if we isolate the total prison population, you can see that it's actually been declining over the last couple of years after a long run of increases. We now see some decline. So this is troubling for uh, an industry that thrives on strong demand for prisons, prison beds. Uh, this is something that's been noted very explicitly by uh, CCA in its, uh, in its 2010 report to the SEC said, the demand for our facilities and services could be adversely affected by leniency, conviction, or parole standards, and sentencing practices. So they, they see the writing on the wall. Uh, so this is troubling for them. and. Uh, in part, they've responded by shifting their focus a bit to immigrants. So this is the real growth area now, immigrant detention. Uh, from 2002 to 2010, the number of detainees held by private firms for Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, uh, that number has tripled. So they now hold about 15,000 detainees at any given time. And in fact, they hold about half of all detainees. It turns out this is a lucrative business to be in. So if you look at uh, total revenues, CCA gets about 20% of its revenues now from these ICE contracts. And GEO gets about 14% of its revenues from these ICE contracts. So there really is a greater emphasis now on locking up immigrants because they see that something's happening in terms of sentencing policy and prison policy. All right, so I focused a lot on private industry and its contribution to mass imprisonment so far. Uh, I want to shift gears and look at the, private, or the public sector now. So <coughs> critics of mass imprisonment have spent a lot of energy criticizing private industry, I think rightfully so. Uh, but today I want to argue that actually we should be paying some more attention to what's going on in the public sector, and in particular in particularly looking at uh, public sector prison guard units. So prison guard unions operate like most other labor unions in the US, and they exist to represent the interests of their members operate about uh, 30 states, 38 states. Uh, they're organized differently. Some are, are parts of larger labor affiliations like AFSCME. Others are independent. Uh, but they all share something in common, which is that they uh, advocate for things like better compensation, better working conditions, more training, uh, appropriate disciplinary procedures. And they'll rarely say explicitly but the fact is, uh, it is in their members' interests to maintain jobs. We can do that by keeping up the prison population. Uh, some of these unions can be powerful, and probably the most powerful one is in California, uh, where we have the California Correctional Peace Officers Association, or CCPOA. Uh, it represents about 30,000 correctional workers, so prison guards and other affiliated staff. They, um, they depict themselves as working the toughest beat in law enforcement. So the idea is that they are just like any other law enforcement official, but in fact, they do a more dangerous job. They <coughs> put their lives on the line when they go into prisons. Uh, CCPOA has long been a political organization, but it's always been nonpartisan. So it will support any law and order 
tough on crime politician, and it will likewise go after any politician who appears soft on crime. So they will support Democrats and they will support Republicans. They do this through uh, a number of different means, lobbying legislators, uh, offering campaign contributions, funding political action committees. Uh, but one of their uh, more effective methods is uh, what Joshua Page is called power by proxy. So as I, as I suggested earlier, prison guards depend on high levels of imprisonment. That's what maintains their jobs. But they can't come out and say this explicitly because it would sound crass and self-serving. So what they've done historically is to partner with other more innocuous groups, uh, in particular victims' rights groups, crime victims' rights groups, who have uh, high moral standing. So these victims' rights groups can come out and advocate for tougher sentences, advocate for free strikes laws, advocate for truth in sentencing laws. And those groups receive critical funding from CCPOA. So CCPOA can stay on the sidelines while they have proxies out advocating for tougher sentences. Examples of this. Um, the, the union does have a record of fighting prison reform measures in California. So, uh, two of their successes involved Proposition 66 from 2004, that would have reduced the scope of the three strikes law in California. And then Proposition 5 from 2008 would have uh, diverted a number of drug offenders out of the prison system and into some treatment. So CCPOA directly and indirectly mounted pretty vigorous opposition campaigns to these propositions. They, they really hinged on um, cultivating voters' fears that, that these measures would release predators into the community and they would prey on families and children. So uh, one example of this is the Felon a Day campaign, uh, which was run formally by Camp, uh, Californians United for Public Safety. This is a crime difference group uh, with funding from CCPOA. But every day, running up to the election, they would release a profile of a felon. And these were typically felons with very long rap sheets, you can see here, detailing all the offenses. Uh, and the suggestion was that if the measure passed, this person would be released into the community would pray on innocent civilians. So, uh, Proposition 66, in this case, actually had a great deal of public support initially. But that support waned as these opposition campaigns got going, and ultimately the proposition failed, and so three strikes was maintained. So, uh, just to conclude, I think we should be heartened that uh, calls to reform the prison system are finally gaining some traction. But I think the reformers need to be mindful of these two powerful constituencies, constituencies that I've talked about private industry and public sector labor unions. Um, reformers, I think, need to be strategic, think strategically about how to minimize resistance. Out of these groups and try to advance uh, more efforts. As little resistance as possible. That's all. Thank you. <laughs>